Oh, wow. Sorry. Okay. Welcome. You're listening to the best of investing on Talk 910, the show where we present valuable information about real estate, the financial markets, and other economic business of the day. And for those of you listening for the first time, here's our format. A few people around, few people sitting around a bar having old, not old, Christmas candy from a few days ago. Uh, talking business with you, the audience listening in. I'm your host, Edward Brown, and I'm pleased to have as my co-host, Mark Hoff of Pacific Private Money, California's fastest growing private lender, Catherine Harris, CPA of Parati and Karad, and Julie Kennedy of Modern, Marin Modern Real Estate. Our phone number is 888-912-1190. Write that number down, 888-912-1190, because you're gonna use that number to answer the trivia questions for three vacations given away during each commercial break. That's right, we're giving away nine vacations during this show. Today's trivia theme is an American Christmas since I don't want Christmas to end. <laughs> Okay. We'll milk it for a few more days. Uh, exactly, that's right. <laughs> Every last it's hour. Christmas the fake. last two months right. haven't been sufficient. That's well, true. Well, I'll yeah. still accept gifts. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> well, and also it's a, a short season because uh, yes. Thanksgiving was a little bit late. And our website is bestofinvesting.com. Check us out on Facebook and YouTube by typing Best of Investing Radio Show. We're also on television, Comcast Channel 26 uh, and AT&T Channel 99 on Saturdays at noon and Sundays at 6 p.m. Catherine, take it away. What you talked about uh, coming 2014, what's going on? I thought it would be appropriate as we kind of end 2013 and go into 2014, we discuss planning for 2014 and some of the items that are coming down the pipeline that really impact really every individual in the country, whether you are somebody who has lower income and have are benefiting from the uh, Obamacare and the possible credits and all the way up to individuals who may get uh, various credits on their tax return. Uh, one that may impact a lot of people is the cancellation of debt. What that is, oh, yeah, is a big one. It's, yeah. a hu it's one that no one really realized because it has it, the a wave of it occurred in the last four or five years yeah. but in, in the last four or five years the government basically said if you had a cancel of, de of debt, if you owned your home and you, when you sold it, you owed more than what you sold it for and you were able not to have to pay the bank back, you usually have to pay income taxes on that. Um, obviously, with a lot of the foreclosures, the short sales that happened in the last few years, there was a huge wave of such activity. Um, and obviously, if somebody had to sell it for a loss and were in foreclosures or had to have a short sale, they already were in a financially unhealthy situation. Yeah, what so, a double whammy. Yes, yes. So to walk yeah. away and then say, oh, hold on. You may have to pay taxes on that as a... You, you know, it's interesting you mentioned the Obamacare thing because I, I have Blue Cross right now, their anthem, and uh, I pay, you know, it's always a lot, right? Yes. But because of being self-employed, you know, I never know if my income's up, down, whatever. And I found out that if I signed up for Obamacare, even though I would get a good deal today, by the end of the year, if my income was higher than it was supposed to be, then I was going to end up having to pay much more than I was paying now. I mean, instead of like 500 and something dollars a year, I'd have to pay like 1100 So I'm looking at this going, you know what, the, forget it, I'm not doing it. You don't realize it, and you yeah. get, they kind of, I don't want to say trick you, but they say, you know, if you're, yeah, no, if you're, no, you if you're below, trick you. <laughs> if you're below the threshold, I think it's like 400000 of the poverty level, you get a credit. But if you go above it, so if you halfway through the year um, don't have a job or maybe have a part-time job and kind of qualify, um, and you get the credit for the entire year, they basically pay the tax, they, they the government yeah. pay the difference on what you pay and what the health insurance needs. Yeah. They'll pay it throughout the year, but come at the end of the year, there's gonna be a reconciliation that's exactly. done, and if you are above that threshold, you have to pay that all back. So you- Or more. Or more, yeah. you, don't, you really don't know, and it's one of those things that, you, if you go in it blindly, you don't know what to expect a year from now, how it's going to have an impact on you, and you do, and you pay it. It comes onto your tax return. It's not something that you can walk away from, and it's not due to the county. It's paid to the to the federal government, so you, you know, could, they can track you down. Absolutely, <laughs> it's funny because we could spend the whole show talking nothing about Obamacare. I think you know, for, from from my perspective. So much more remains to be seen in 2014. If nothing else, it's going to continue to peel back the curtains of exactly how this, you know, one of the largest um, legislative bills to pass in, in our history, how that's going to affect affect all of us in our pocketbooks. And and it's interesting. I keep 
thinking back to Nancy Pelosi's comment about we have to pass the Obamacare <laughs> bill to see what's in it. <laughs> yes, and, uh, true. and now we're seeing what's in it, and you know some of it's good and some of it's not so good, and some of it's not as it was promised or painted or marketed uh, back when by the uh, you know the folks on the, the Democrat side of the of the uh, of the aisle. A capital bill. Yeah, yeah. So it's 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 really interesting and, and frustrating, and it's you know what's I guess what's boring to me is, and I think this is going to happen more and more with the public as it goes on is. It's, it's always like, there's always an article that, at the top of like, you know, wallstreetjournal.com or wherever you go to read something, it's, it's like the, what's the latest angle, rub, issue, surprise, vis-a-vis -vis Obamacare. Yes. Mm -hmm. I'm oh, already yeah. getting tired of it. It's like, oh, this is going to be an endless nightmare. And it will be for a while. Oh, my gosh. This, it, this yeah. is just, this, it's only been two months. And I, you can see that the, <sighs> a lot of these items you can't even, you can't predict. You don't even think about. I don't think President Obama realized when he was saying, oh, if you have your health insurance, you can keep it. And he promised it. He just wasn't thinking about it down the road and its impact. And you'll, it's only going to happen over the next year, two years, the implications. And they've deferred some of the things. Yeah. They've deferred mm -hmm. uh, uh, some of the required disclosures and the reporting requirements for another year. So we think maybe all of this is going to be impacted this year. It's not going to happen. What was the latest Morbid. big deferral that was the news this week? The, the, something about individuals being able to defer... Are you, are you up on that? Uh, well, I mean, the, there was obviously the one where they basically, there was the wave where, okay, if you had your insurance and it doesn't meet the minimum, you can keep it. That was what Obama did a few weeks ago. Yeah, yeah. And then the most recent one that I'm aware of was how to do with small businesses and the ability to, I think, offer their plan on the ex some type of exchange. I think that yeah. was deferred another year. Well, what I don't understand, though, about the this latest deferment that um, Mark just mentioned is how can... If the insurance company has canceled your policy and now Obama says, oh no, you can keep it, but that policy is no longer available. I think it will, it's somewhat grandfathered in now, is that it's going to be until you want a change. Once it's changed, it will not be, it's not available to anybody today mm -hmm. for next year. But if you had it a year ago, it's available and you can continue it this year. I'm not 100% sure this is one place where CPA does not know everything, <laughs> but I know enough to be dangerous and to ask a question or two. Well, just I have a friend who was telling me her sad story, and again, another self-employed person. And she got denied the California care, so they referred her over to, to Medicare. Oh, oh, I didn't think you could get denied California. Well, wait, wait, is it because well, her income's did. so low? It was so low. Because she's at Medi-Cal. Right. Well, that's yeah. why. So now I'm teasing her. She's now a welfare queen, right? Because, and this is a woman yes. who works and very that, hard, but it, like you can't predict her income. Yeah. And, and it could all change. So she, when she sent this, her, her application, her application yeah. in, the, the woman Sorry, on the other end of the line, no, yeah. this is when she got to the Medi-Cal part. Oh. They, they were like, oh, yeah, it was so impressive. Guess what? You can qualify for. And, and I think yeah. it's just rolled up into it now. So people just, that's what it is. It's the option. And she just has to be careful of it if she just does she doesn't know how her income is going to play out for the year, she needs to plan for it and be prepared yeah. to mm -hmm. put some money aside for some extra taxes. Kind of scary. Okay, we're going to go to a quick commercial break. We okay. All right. Here is the theme. Again, is uh, an American Christmas. Here is the first question. What character plays the innkeeper in A Charlie Brown Christmas? Don't touch that dial. The Best of Investing will be right back. Welcome back to The Best of Investing. I'm Edward Brown, your host, along with Mark Hahn, Catherine Harris, and Julie Kennedy. When we cut to the first commercial break, again, the theme is An American Christmas. We ask this trivia question. What character plays the innkeeper in A Charlie Brown Christmas? Ladies? I'm stumped. Mark? Pig pen. Pig pen. No. That is correct. How appropriate <laughs> pig pen to do a I've only uh, seen that thing about a hundred times. Yeah. I uh, didn't see it this holiday season. There were quite a few things I didn't see this season. Yeah, that, that mic's a little uh, funky. That's why it goes. Okay. Well, it. <laughs> okay. So, Julie, you're you're on now. Uh, you have an interesting article for us. Well, I actually have some predictions. Uh, is that better? That's a lot better. It is crackling. Yeah. Um, predictions for 2014 with regard to uh, the San Francisco Bay Area real estate yeah. market. Okay. And um, one of the things that I see. Um, well, first of all, I wanted to just touch on this this poor self-employed person, okay. because as of next year, it is going to be more difficult for a person without a W-2 to qualify for a loan. So ah. we've got now a 
uh, uh, debt to income ratio. So the poor self-employed person, which I am, I think three of us in this room are, yep. are going to be suffering because we can't, we don't have that that W two on our hands. I know when you go for a loan, and let's say your Schedule C is unemployed, you show your tax Pretty return, but then they're going to still ask for bank statements and sure. make you prove anything over like a hundred dollars. Where did that money come from? Right, right. Yeah, it's it's pretty crazy. Um, the Bay Area being um, populated by a lot of self-employed yes. people. I mean, that what you're talking about is the qualified mortgage rule that goes into effect on January 10. Right. And why it goes on in effect to the 10th, and not the first, I have no idea why, but on January 10th, the qualified mortgage rule goes into effect, and that uh, basically makes it more difficult for lenders to make consumer home loans because in the interest of uh, basically preventing banks from making loans that consumers cannot afford, they are now required to prove your ability to make those monthly payments. And guess what? W-2s are great for that, but if you're self-employed and you don't have a mm -hmm. W-2 and you um, file your business on your Schedule C or maybe you're a, a, a subchapter S corporation or maybe even an LLC, you know, most of us who operate in that manner, and I do personally, you know, we're got pretty good at expensing lots and lots of sure. things uh, through our companies and trying like that to candy for instance <laughs> <laughs> that's right that's a promotional expense yes, absolutely by the way yeah we're all sitting here munching on <laughs> julie's uh, christmas candy which is delicious by the way <laughs> i'll call, try call to julie at this number to get that <laughs> yes. candy. Yeah. and so um you know so those of us who you know look to minimize our tax burden by taking all of those deductions that we are entitled to uh, Right, Catherine? Sure. We're not, we're yes, not, we're yes. Not, it's Supreme it's Court not says, tax avoidance, it's tax minimization, right? No, no, it's not tax You're evasion. You're paying your evasion. Evasion. Fair. Right, no, yeah, Avoidance not, is okay, yeah, evasion Avoidance is, is okay, right. Evasion, right. That, I got it backwards there. Yeah. <laughs> so anyway, it remains to be seen how that's going to affect the real estate market mm -hmm. uh, going forward. Is it going to significantly decrease the number of buyers qualified to buy homes? It's that's the to. prediction. It, well, it yeah, it I mean, the math to. is, it has yeah. to, right? right. And again, as you said, so many of the people in the Bay Area are self-employed. But then on the flip side of that, I think we're going to see um, some real change in the way the market's happening now because of of the young generation. We've got the Twitter and the Google people who have who have all decided, or not all, but many have decided that with the with the rents as they are now in the San Francisco Bay Area, uh -huh. maybe in fact they want to, they're willing to give up a little bit of that independence. Mm -hmm and settle down, buy a place, they're attracted to kind of the the urban core or any areas that are close to transit. So we're going to see that money coming in m more into the probably townhouse, condo market, not in the far suburbs, but close to San Francisco, city center, uh, San Mateo is another hot spot because we've got the Caltrans anywhere where there's public, public transportation, transportation right. running, you know. In Marin, you know, years ago, the Marin voters decided they didn't want BART. Yeah. And it still is uh, a, a bit of a push for somebody, particularly the new, this new young generation who ride their bikes, who like to take public transportation. And unless it's the ferry or a limited Golden Gate Transit, Marin is not going to be, I don't think, as big of a player with that particular that demographic group. Good point. Good point. What other predictions do you see there in your little bag of goodies? Well, I see that if I were a seller, I would start thinking this is a pretty good time to put my house on the market if I was thinking about it. Because I, I feel that the, the market is it's not softening, but we're not going to have that crazy, frenetic um, uh, seller's market that we had. It'll continue to be a seller's market, but I believe we're going to see more inventory in the market which will obviously you know, bring more, down, uh, bring more yeah. competition. Yeah. And as soon as there's more competition, more homes on the market. Because remember, those sellers, they're going to have to find a place to live. Exactly. And one of the things that has been very interesting at the end of this year, we've had a couple of sales where the buyer has made an offer based contingent upon the sale of their own home. 
and the seller has accepted that. Now really? that might that, sound very unusual in the seller's nowadays, market, nowadays, yeah. but what the seller realizes is that just as his home sold very quickly, that guy's house is going to turn quickly too. So the, so the agents have a conversation, the seller's agent and the buyer's agent, they talk to the buyer's listing agent, yeah. tell me about this house, show me the comps. And we've had accepted offers. That's amazing because I remember a few years ago mm -hmm. you, you you couldn't do that. You had no, to get all cash years. off. Of but if everybody's able to close within a very short, reasonable yeah, amount now, of time, nowadays, yeah. it's really conceivable and it's nice because buyers are coming to us saying, "Well, I still have a house to sell. Do you think if I found something, I could make an offer?" Yeah, I'm saying sure. It's happening now, and you would suggest doing it now, not waiting for the summer, spring, spring summer. That's usually where people, a lot more individuals, start putting their houses on the market. I would say there's no time like now because we don't know what what the yeah. markets. We but don't know what interest rates are going to do. So, and if people do that in the spring, then you're just going to be following the herd. Exactly. And you want to maybe get in ahead of time. Well, that's interesting that you predict that, Julie. So what you're saying is, is, um, well, well, let me ask you, uh, mm -hmm. actually, um, see if so I understood what you were saying. Put it on the market now versus spring, as opposed to now versus 2015. Because there are you? Well, I think yes, now versus spring, absolutely. Because again, you're everyone seems to wait the herd, yeah, wait yeah. until spring. Yeah. But there are buyers out there. We have three escrows closing this week. Wow! Right before, or right around, right, right, uh, yes. right, 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 yeah. right after Christmas, Christmas the, week. The buyers Christmas are out week, there, yeah. and and for whatever reason, people do have to sell. They may be. Re Relocating, divorce, a, a trust sale. Yeah, a lot of times they want to start the new year, something, yeah. something brand new. Right. Okay, tell you what, we're going to uh, cut to another quick commercial break. When we come back, we've got some very interesting emails for our hosts here. Again, the theme is a an American Christmas. In the popular song, what brought Frosty the Snowman to life? Don't touch that dial. The best of investing. We'll be right back. Welcome back to The Best of Investing. I'm Edward Brown, your host, along with Mark Hahn, Catherine Harris, and Julie Kennedy. When we cut to the second commercial break, we ask this trivia question. Again, the theme is An American Christmas. In the popular song, what brought Frosty the Snowman to life? You've three blanks. <laughs> three oh. blank stairs. Three yes. blind mice. An old silk hat. Oh, God, and we no. would We would accept Never. a hat. <sighs> Remember when they put a hat, he started dancing around? No. La -da 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 -da. Okay, uh, let's get right into email time here. Mark, we have an email for you. It's very interesting. It says, I have heard you on the show before. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to summarize this. Um, that basically there were specific reasons why you started a fund. What were they? So kind of get a little background on that for us. Okay. Um, my name is Mark Hoff. I'm broker for Pacific Private Money. We're a private money lender, also called Hard Money Lender, based in Marin County, and we specialize in making loans to real estate investors. Uh, oftentimes those loans are for guys who are either buying, fixing, or flipping uh, property, which is actually a thriving uh, marketplace right now, uh, or to people who are uh, buying property to hold for rental, rental income. And the reason we're able to make those loans is the banks largely pulled out of that marketplace uh, after 2008. Again, a lot of people just aren't aware of this, but you cannot buy income property anymore the way you used to be able to uh, prior to 2008 when the whole universe changed. Well, especially now, also with uh, Julie bringing up about how self-employed people are going to have even a harder time. Well, and that's, you know, and the result of the mortgage meltdown that happened in 2008 and the financial markets and all that scary stuff that happened uh, in, in around the fourth quarter of 2008 is that uh, they've changed a lot of the laws around lending and so they've made it harder for banks to lend and the private money lending industry has picked up the slack. So that's a little bit of a background. We have a thriving uh, marketplace right now for private money loans. And so the question was, um, I understand you have a mortgage pool fund. Why did you decide to go that route? Well, most of the loans that we've made to date at Pacific Private Money, we've made over 600 loans to real estate investors since 2008. Most of them have been funded by private individuals um, in the form of an individual note, uh, which is also called trustee investing. And all that means is that, that the individual who basically made their money available to fund that loan, their name actually, or the name of their trust, depending on how they let the money, actually went on the note. So they were the lender. They were acting like the bank. And that's how a lot of private money loans are funded these days, with the individual person's name on that loan there and 
they're basically the lender and they, they lend it through a licensed California mortgage broker, which is what we are at Pacific Private Money. We do all the paperwork, they supply the funds, we originate a loan to a borrower. Now, fast forward to 2013, and there are so many people now who have learned about this opportunity to make 8% or more on your money secured by real estate. And so more and more people have been entering the marketplace looking for opportunities. Our phone's been ringing off the hook with people calling saying, I'd like to get in on your list of investors. Well, it turns out that so many people have called that it's almost impossible for us to service them one, one by one individually. So we decided it was the perfect time to start the Mortgage Pool Fund, which I actually started over a year ago, and we launched it in early 2013. And the Mortgage Pool Fund is designed for those people who are interested in making higher yields on their savings, but they're unable to get in on these opportunities for individual notes because the demand is so high and the competition is so strong for them. Well, I, I can attest to that because, I mean, fortunately I have invested in your fund, mm -hmm. um, but I also get emails from other you know, hard money lenders, right? And I got this one opportunity that was at, it was only 8%, but I thought, okay, that, that's not too bad. Only. Mm -hmm. Only, I yeah. Yes. <laughs> Compared, well, you're paying <laughs> higher, uh, you know? <laughs> but anyway, so I decided, oh, fun, I'll, I'll just go ahead and, because uh, it looked like a decent piece of property. And I went ahead and literally 10 minutes, only 10 minutes went by, and I replied, yes, I'm interested. They, they sent me back about five minutes later, sorry, you're too late. Two other my people. My gosh. Yeah, are, are, got it. So, great. Now I got my money sitting at, you know, point zero 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 one percent waiting for another deal. I could just go ahead and invest with, with Mark and get the... Right, so if you're thinking to yourself, you're listening to my answer here, and you're thinking to yourself... Oh, no. Go ahead, keep going. So if you're thinking to yourself, how does... How does this affect? Um, sorry about that. We had a technical glitch yeah. there. So if you're if you're thinking about how does this affect me and my opportunity, if there's a, a, a strong competition for individual notes, why would a mortgage pool fund have an advantage? And the reason for that is is because we are the originator. We are the broker at Pacific Private Money. We can decide with as the and we fund about 15 to 20 transactions per month. We can decide whether we're going to offer that individually or we're going to offer it to the fund. And guess what? The way I wrote the um, prospectus for the fund is that my promise to fund shareholders is that the fund gets the first opportunity to fund every loan that comes through our uh, organization, that comes through our brokerage. So the fund gets to cherry pick all the best deals. And so the highest quality loans with the best borrowers, with the best opportunities, uh, are funded through our mortgage pool fund first, and then whatever the fund uh, either doesn't have the capital at the moment to fund or we decide is not fund worthy, we offer that to our individual investors. And again, we've got a stable of individual investors uh, who are very well healed and are able to make decisions very quickly. So, Do you call them a stable or a harem? <laughs> <laughs> so I'm actually not taking new uh, individual note investors at this time. We have too many people who prefer individual notes. Instead, we're marketing for uh, consumers who are looking for opportunities to put their money to work, to earn 8% or more on a passive investment, which is how the fund works. Uh, we have uh, right now the fund, uh, as of the third quarter, uh, we're going to make our fourth quarter distribution in another couple of weeks, but our third quarter distribution was at an annualized rate of 8.9%. But, but how risky? Yeah, well, we, how, pretty nice. Yeah. Huh? With, how, with a weighted average loan yeah. to value in the fund of just 60%. And that's very important to understand. Yeah. People yeah. need to yeah. understand yeah. that. We don't make going risky loans. We don't make high percentage loans. We make conservative loans uh, secured conser by barrier real estate. That's actually more conservative than the bank loans. Exactly. Yeah. And, and if, if I understand correctly, you are generally the first borrower. So you are the first position. First position. First position. Right. Virtually so, every loan we make so is the first position. Give us a quick loan. synopsis. Why, why are these borrowers willing to pay? What kind of interest rate are they paying? usually between 9 and 10 percent and the reason they're willing to pay that much money for a, a loan is because well a the bank isn't making them the loan so they don't have an option to go to the bank and get it for five percent but more importantly we make these loans quickly uh, we're able to help them uh, use leverage to execute a real estate strategy and that's again something that again the banks are just not able to serve that niche right now okay we have we have a couple of minutes let's finish off with you 
And um, give us the example you gave on our earlier show called Mortgage Investing 101 about the people who wanted to buy a house, but then they also wanted to sell their other house. We did a bridge loan last week for a consumer that uh, owned their home, intended to put it on the market, and identified a home they wanted to purchase. They thought they could buy this home using a bank loan and found out that they did not qualify to have two bank loans at the same time to, on two primary residences. So they came to Pacific Private Money for what's called a bridge loan and we were able to make them a loan at 70% of the purchase price on this Napa home, lovely home that was a newer build in Napa. We made them a 70% purchase loan with the belief and intention that they would pay that loan off very quickly. So the interest rate was high, I think it was 9.9%. We made the loan to them and we charged uh, two points on the origination fee. So it wasn't inexpensive, but it was a tool that allowed this, this, this family to buy, to take advantage of a buy opportunity but not risk selling their home first and having to move twice or put their stuff in storage, which is expensive. So on the one hand, they saved that extra money by having to move twice, but they did have to pay about $7,500 in fees to do that loan. So again, that's an example of, um, you know, of, of, of being able to operate quickly. One last thing, we closed that loan in four business days because they thought they had a bank who was going to make that loan and the bank last minute pulled out, deciding that they did not, uh, wow. the underwriting wasn't there. Those so, rascals. Was, so, right, so they were looking at losing the opportunity and losing their deposit. And I got a frantic call from a friend of ours who was actually uh, a former co host on this very show, uh, Jeremy Forcier, who called me and said, Mark, can you close? It was Tuesday morning. He said, Can you close by Friday? And uh, after he gave me the description, I said, I think I can help you. I bet you love getting those calls. I <laughs> yes. I Catherine, I have a question, though, when, when Mark was talking about the interest points. Would that be tax deductible for the uh, for the buyer? Generally speaking, yes. If it's do when you're when you are in the process of buying homes like that, that generally speaking, mm -hmm. you could you have the ability. Now, obviously, there are limits and sure. exceptions to it, but yes. Mm -hmm. um, but speaking to the point, you, four days, you just don't hear of no. that yep. nowadays. And w when 2014 comes, and specifically January 10th comes, <laughs> and there's this income <laughs> debt right. to income limit. Mm -hmm. There is going to be another market out there yes. yeah. uh, that I didn't even think that existed until today. Mm -hmm. Market for Mark. Excellent. Uh, we're going to cut to our third and final commercial break. Again, the theme is An American Christmas. What is the largest selling Christmas song of all time? I know you've heard of the song. Don't touch that dial. The best of investing will come right back with a couple of very interesting emails for our other two co-hosts. Welcome back to The Best of Investing. I'm Edward Brown, your host, along with Mark Hahn, Catherine Harris, and Julie Kennedy. When we cut to the third and final commercial break, again, the theme is an American Christmas. What is the largest selling Christmas song of all time? White Christmas? Yes, White Christmas. Yes. And that's, that's actually impressive. the song that my wife and I first met. We danced to. So she remember that. Aww. Aww. Every time it comes on, I sing, and she says, Ed, Edward, I love to hear you sing. Send her, sing 10 or 15 miles from here. Yes. No. Can you okay. sing over the hill and far away? Yeah, yeah exactly. That's right. <laughs> okay. It's a Led Zeppelin song. Isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, email for Catherine it says here, since you're a CPA, certified public accountant, uh, how much advice should a CPA give other than doing my tax return? My current CPA seems to be afraid <laughs> to step outside the tax arena. <laughs> you know, it does depend on who you talk to. Uh, some CPAs have extra uh, letters in addition to just the CPA after their name and ha mm -hmm. feel qualified to speak on other matters. Others just want to give tax advice and don't want to have that legal obligation or the, possi the liability if they were to give other advice. Your CPA is a great resource to at least get some information, some things they'll know off the bat. I mean, we, we spoke earlier about health insurance. I know enough to start asking questions and hmm. point okay. somebody in the right direction. We have, we may not know the answer, but we may know, we have a lot of people that we do know in different industries that we could uh, give a referral to. See, that's the important thing is, you know, anyone who says that he or she knows everything, you can stay away from that person, but at least you know what you don't know, so you, at mm -hmm. least you have the contacts. Yes. And, and your firm, Parati and Karat, I mean, they're not a very, they're not that small a company. No, we are uh, we are located in Larkspur. We're one 
office firm. There are about 15 of us, about 10 of us are professionals. Mm -hmm. um, so you do actually get the, the value and the, the experience of not just one individual, which I find to be something that you don't, I, I would prefer to have in a CPA. Somebody who, if I don't know the answer, I have somebody available immediately who may be the expert in nonprofits or somebody who's the expert when it comes to um, estate planning. planning. Um, we briefly touched it in the beginning is that a lot of things are happening in 2014 that will impact not just people who have incomes over a hundred thousand two hundred thousand there's as we said health insurance that will have an impact on, on individuals who have less income so don't sit down and wait till April 1st be proactive get on um, get on and talk to a CPA and, and generally when you're getting referrals from people uh, is it because of tax advice I mean what because you get referrals all the time generally speaking that's the tax advice but we also do bookkeeping services we do um, auditing services the test services for nonprofits or individuals or businesses that need to have reporting to their bank or to a government agency uh, we do those services as well and those those uh, services are harder to find Nowadays. They are harder to find. A lot of CPA firms just they don't do that anymore. Yes, and that gives us again a bit more information, much more, a bit more knowledge about what you should be doing in planning. Because you're, if you are a business that's on the accrual basis, you need to know about the gap accounting. Oh, yeah. I start talking accounting later. No, that's now. okay. Uh, so again, because you did give us a lot of good feedback here on the uh, Obama situation in 2014 and, and tax advice. That's Catherine Harris, CPA of Parati and Karad. Okay, we have also a question here for Julie. It says, how often do you represent the buyer and seller? Since you're a real estate agent, mm -hmm. do you see a conflict of interest? That's a pretty good question. Well, to answer the first question, <coughs> never. I have never uh, represented, as we call it, double-ended a deal. Okay. Um, when I take a listing, I usually sit down or I do sit down with my client and I explain to them that there is an inherent conflict of interest. Now, I'm, I'm, I would say that there are many, many agents in the industry that would not uh, agree with me and do double-end, but I often tell my client it's a little bit like having a single attorney for both yeah, the yeah. plaintiff and the defendant. Yeah, because in theory, what's good for one may not be right. good for the other. Now, I, I think that there are a few situations, circumstances, so I, I never have because I haven't found yet a situation where I would feel comfortable. Well, what do you do when you find, you have a listing and you just happen to have a buyer, right. what do you do? Well, I either would uh, bring in someone else from my firm or my broker to okay. represent the buyer. Okay. Because y you have a fiduciary responsibility. Yeah. And h how can you, knowing, for example, something in your mind that's, that's in essence um, part of the, the seller's strategy, yeah. and then the buyer has a strategy, I just don't see how ethically you could do it. Now, if, if yeah. somebody has a home and this is the price they want and somebody comes along and says, I'm just going to... Just going to take it tomorrow. Wrap it up. Yeah, that might be simple, but most real estate transactions are uh, not no, no. that simple. Well, also you have disclosures and you know the, the roof leaks and you know mm -hmm. you have all that kind of stuff too. Um, very, very interesting on that. So you do see a conflict. You know, it's funny. I, I don't. I haven't met too many real estate agents who are honest enough to say that they don't double end. I'm most surprised. Of, as yeah, well. I mean, most I, of them I just go, sure, that. I want yes. a commission on both ends. You know? Yes, because I have a lovely partner, Natalie Kemp, so we do work together. And uh, sometimes we can avoid that conflict of interest, too, because nice having a partner. We have run into a situation where immediately, if we think that we're going to have an interested buyer, Natalie can take that client, and then we stop all joint communication. So well, that, we, we actually kind of sever. Tough. Well, it is and it isn't because actually I really trust Natalie to uh, uphold the, the ethics part, yeah. uh, and, uh, and she trusts me. And so, it, and I never like to feel anyway, regardless of who the other agent is on the other side, yeah. it's not adversarial. It shouldn't be adversarial. Should, it shouldn't be, yeah. You should be coming to consensus and doing the, the best work for your individual client. But 
Being well, positional will yeah, not well, advance yeah, the it, deal. Yeah, it's not, it's not a lawsuit. I mean, it's right. more of a contra contract. It is. It's really the, that kind of uh, bargaining. It's, it's almost like mediation in a way. I like in to, a way. Yeah, I like to think a, of it that but way. But in a that, friendly way, though. Right. Well, that someone wins and some everyone wins a little and everyone loses a little bit in the end. Yeah. Of course, in the buyer's market that it is now, mostly it's the seller that... I mean, the seller's market is the seller that's winning. Well, and a, and a very <laughs> yeah. wise person once told me that the uh, agent's commission is the cheapest commission that gets paid because the, the mm -hmm. agent usually has to work hard enough to, to justify to, to justify, yeah. And mm -hmm. a lot of people, they'll do a, a FISBO, as they say, a for sale by owner. But then what happens is a, an astute buyer, which most of buyers are now fairly astute, mm -hmm. they'll say, well, if you're not paying a commission, I'm going to just lower the purchase price by that amount. So you've kind of defeated that. You know, it's better to have an advocate on your side. Exactly. Absolutely. There's no free lunch in real estate. You're, you're, you're absolutely right. A FISBO is not going to get a full retail market value offer more often than not. Yeah. And actually may usually be less. Mm -hmm. that, that's they true. don't know how, they don't have the skills to negotiate. Exactly. Yeah. So we have uh, just about a minute to go before we get to our thoughts for the day. Uh, any last minute uh, coming up here on the new year? Oh, I can talk about more fun things that are happening on the taxes. <laughs> Besides, oh, boy. Boy. yes, <laughs> I know. Well, that's what I'm. I'm really curious to see what 2014 brings. Yes, we talked about the Medicare. The excuse me, the Obamacare. Mm -hmm. We've talked about the debt to income uh, limit, mm -hmm. and there's other credits, other activity that's coming that's not to the benefit of any individuals. Uh, there. Right now, there is, we talked about the cancellation of debt. The teacher's credit that teachers get on their tax returns is set to expire. Uh, there's this year, in 2013, the Medicare and the investment tax that's coming into play. There's bonus depreciation that's coming into play. So there's a lot of things that are So people are going to need to call Catherine Harris yeah. to get more information sure. on that. I'm not trying to plug it. Consult. Like, like, uh, sure. yeah, yeah. Consult. Okay. Here's, here's our thoughts for the day. So yesterday, I thought I would surprise my wife, so I came home with flowers and said, just cause, no special occasion. Now instead of being happy, she scowled at me. Why? Because as it turns out, it was her birthday. That's the last time I forget. And then she says, the last thing I want to do is hurt you, but it's still on the list. So by the way, Mark, can I stay at your house tonight? <laughs> okay, tune in next week to The Best of Investing. We're going to be giving away nine more free vacations for answering trivia questions. And uh, hopefully I'll still be here, I'll be alive to, to do this after my wife gets a hold of me. Thanks for listening. On behalf of our team, I'm Edward Brown, wishing you the best of investing. So long. Welcome. You're listening to the best of investing on Talk 910. You know our show. It's where we present valuable information about real estate, the financial markets, and other economic business of the day. And for those of you listening for the first time, here's our format. A few guys sitting around a bar having drinks or without the drinks, talking business with you, the audience listening in. I'm your host, Edward Brown, and I'm pleased to have as my co-host, Mark Honf of Pacific Private Money, California's fastest growing private lender and Robert Spinoza of RPM Mortgage. Today's trivia theme is baseball teams in the movies. This week in baseball. Remember that? Yeah, that was a great show. I love that show. Uh, that was, I guess, before ESPN and all that yeah. stuff. Okay. Uh, Mel Allen. That's Mel Allen. Yep. Our website is bestofinvesting.com. Check us out on Facebook and YouTube <coughs> by typing Best of Investing Radio Show. And we're also on television, Comcast Channel 26 and AT&T Channel 99 on Saturdays at noon and Sundays at 6 p.m. And uh, we're going to get right into it. Rob, you've got some excellent articles to share with our audience. Well, Happy New Year, guys. Yeah, happy New Year. <laughs> yeah, yeah, absolutely. 2014 promises to be an interesting year in mortgage lending. And the reason for that is because a lot of the Dodd-Frank uh, uh, laws and rules go into effect. And, and the industry is bracing for that. And, of course, you know, we, we talk about that, but it also comes at the time when a lot of people are making predictions about what do you think 2014 is going to look like. So I thought I'd open it up with that and just ask you guys, what, you know, what are your thoughts on the market and uh, what, what do you think the attitudes are out there about real estate right now? Well, I think it's going up. <laughs> the price is going yeah, up? Yeah, I don't, I don't think it's uh, you know, going to be huge, but right. especially if interest rates go up a little bit. But That's but it seems like it's going to be uh, stable, let's put it that way, a stable market. Well, it's interesting because I went back through, you know, because I keep, you know, several folders on the show uh, where I've looked at, you know, looking at past blog uh, posts. And I was actually looking from last December 
to see what people were predicting that 2013 yeah, would look like. Right. And what was interesting is, you know, you're hearing now, um, you know, from the last several months about how foreclosure activity has gone down significantly. Well, that was actually what was newsworthy in January of 2013, which was um, there was dr the biggest change from 2012 was the dramatic decline in foreclosure sales and, and how uh, notices of default had gone down. Well, you know, as it turns out, what we saw happen in 2013 is a couple things. Number one, housing prices appreciated in most markets significantly higher than predicted. I think there, I don't mm -hmm. think anybody was predicting double digit uh, increases in, in housing prices right. at this time a year ago. Um, but there was also, you know, this prediction of, of what was going to happen in the foreclosure market and how foreclosure sales were going to be down considerably. Well, that's actually true, and that's what happened. But what made up the difference is that short sales became really the market, the, the biggest market factor for real estate investors, at least the ones that uh, I serve at Pacific okay, Private so, Money. So the bank didn't want to go through the foreclosure. They just would rather short sale it. Uh, well, they, they right. They, yeah. There was just there seemed to be, you know, I wouldn't call it a lack of interest, but for many reasons, much of them political uh, and, uh, um, uh, you know, and pressure from the government, really, uh, well, that is political. For, for, for political reasons, there were just fewer and fewer foreclosures. Uh, people were still in default. People were still not right. making their mortgage payments, but it was taking longer and longer for the bank to do anything about it. And, you know, more and more people you know, when you're living under that stress of not knowing what's going to happen to you, a lot of people in 2013 decided, you know, let's just sell the house. Let's put it on the market. Let's, yeah, let's short been sell dealing it. dealing with this long enough time. Right. So, and so short sales actually became a bit more, it's still, there's still some work to be done on that, but a bit more streamlined, uh, meaning that they were happening a little bit faster than, you know, pr than prior. I think a year ago, the reputation of a short sale was that it took about six months for yeah. it to go through. A year later, we're seeing uh, short sales that are happening at a much, at a much, much faster clip. Not always, but uh, but at a much faster clip. But I think that's going to continue for 2014. I think 2014 what about the is shadow inventory. Uh, been well, the shadow about. inventory is what you're talking about are the two million homes in California that are fundamentally uh, either underwater or they have so little equity that the, that they can't sell. That there's there's not enough room for them to sell and pay a real estate commission or put enough money in their pocket to be able to buy another home. So why would you sell your home right. if you end up with nothing in your pocket, no ability to buy another house? Well, what so, about the banks, though, that, that already had foreclosed and had all that inventory? That shadow inventory is not very large. That That's not a... They got rid of the banks? No, no, no. There's still, there's still, I think at last count, there were like 40,000 homes in California that were bank-owned still. Okay. Um, but those are, you know, those are working their way through the market as, as prices have gone up. Uh, the, those are being sold. Some of them are being sold in bulk to hedge fund investors. Right, I was and, just going to say. Yeah, so that, that number is going to continue to decline. Well, I, I thought one of the reasons that there lack of floor foreclosures is that anybody who was going to get foreclosed already had gotten foreclosed. You'd be surprised, and that also depends state by state, because California is a different process than some of the East Coast states, too. So I think when we talk about it, we, we tend to focus on California here, and it's quite a bit different. But I want to talk about or comment on what Mark said about the, the short sale process, because what I've witnessed as a lender is that I've found that some real estate agents have become particularly adept at working these things through. They know what the lender is going to ask for. They know how to counsel their clients. And if you can get the, the seller into that channel and get it done that way, the outcome can be quite positive. And I think that spilled over into 2013 and really helped uh, encourage those kinds of sales, get that inventory on the market, and then get new people into those homes, which helps all the way around. What I think is going to be interesting is, um, you know, the, the area of short sales that, that and, and I'll admit I'm not familiar with whether or not there are short sale experts. That would be a, a, a real estate agent a, uh, who is a, considers himself a short sale specialist. Mm -hmm. But really the, the elephant in the room, I think, has been, you know, what about those who have stayed current in their payments but are underwater and would would like to sell their home, want want to sell their home for, for any number of reasons. Can they? Will that be something that that starts yeah. to become more popular or even not not so much popular, but will that be 
a, a strategy? Will there uh, be a segment of the of the marketplace for uh, in real estate? Will you be able to find a, a real estate professional who knows how to navigate the system well enough so that even even you being yeah. current in your payments, can you can you sell your house? Because there are a lot of people who yeah. need to sell. I agree with that, and and I think that plays right back into the start of our topic, which is what do you think is going to happen in 2014? And what's very interesting is I hear a lot of real estate agents comment on what they think is going to be the rate of appreciation, but what doesn't come up in that conversation, uh, and when I talk with real estate agents, very often they're not familiar with how some of the new regulations are going to affect consumers. Yet I've got an article here from David Stevens, who's now the president and CEO of the Mortgage Bankers Association, but previously ran the FHA. And he says, flat out, the new housing regulations going into effect tip the scales of consumer or protection well beyond protection and now lean toward prevention. So how do you as a real estate agent not factor this into your thinking about what happens with home values and then as a result of that, what happens to the consumer who may be in the situation you just described? Mm -hmm. I, I think it's going to be interesting to watch this play out. Okay. Well, hey. none of, are, are, is it commercial time? Uh, no, you, go ahead. There, um, <coughs> none of the blogs that I'm reading uh, of the professionals in the real estate industry are predicting double-digit increases right, right. Uh, right now. They're, they're thinking that the combination of Dodd-Frank uh, and slowly rates. rising rates right. are such that uh, appreciation that we're, st we're not going to see a decline in prices, at least not according to any of the predictions I'm reading, not that anyone would, <laughs> in, in, would, would likely well, predict that. Well, we can cover that in the next segment. Yeah, uh, but, uh, the but herd the mentality also comes in yeah. here, and that's what I've witnessed. I've, seen, I've seen as low as three and as high as is eight uh, with the, with the uh, percentage, yeah, percentage yeah. Incre uh, increase with the average being around six percent of, of those predicting uh, continued increases in real well, estate. Well, I'm, I'm going to make a guarantee. It'll either <laughs> go down, <laughs> go up, or stay the same. There you go. Okay, we're going to cut to our first commercial break, and again, the theme is baseball teams in the movies. Here's the first trivia question. In the movie Little Big League, which Major League Baseball team was featured? This is the one where the grandfather dies and uh, gives the baseball team to the kid. It's actually, a, I, I enjoyed the movie quite a bit, actually. And when we come back, uh, we have a couple of interesting emails here that are talking about uh, lines of credit on homes and FICO scores. Don't touch that dial. The best of investing will be right back. Welcome back to The Best of Investing. I'm Edward Brown, your host, along with Mark Hahn and Rob Spinoza. When we cut to the first commercial break, we ask this trivia question. And again, the theme is baseball teams in the movies. In the movie Little Big League, which Major League Baseball team was featured? Now, Rob, you said you saw the movie, I but don't, you don't remember. I don't remember. Let's Art? go back to don't know. <laughs> the Minnesota Twins. Oh, all right. That's the one where the grandfather, uh, uh, Jason Ray Robards, uh, was uh, dying, and he gives the team to the kid and the uh, is a great group the grandfather and uh, the kid knows all about baseball and then he ends up being the manager it's actually a good movie okay now we're gonna get right into email time here uh, mark a question we received for you is can you think of any situation that I should use a hard money lender if I have a FICO score of over 700 that's an interesting question. It is, and so I can think right off the top of my head of two reasons why you would uh, use a hard money loan versus a bank loan uh, with if you have good credit. I mean, even if you have stellar credit, if you have an 800 FICO score okay. and lots of money in the bank and you've got uh, and a great uh, W-2 job, all of which the banks love, uh, two situations would be, number one, um, in this competitive marketplace for finding investment grade real estate, uh, you might have to close quickly. And in fact, okay. more often than not, if you're going to get a property in contract, you're going to need to have a contract offer with not only no contingencies, forget about a loan contingency of 21 yeah. or 30 days, no contingencies other than uh, maybe a short 7 or 10 day inspection period, uh, but you also might need to close quickly. You might need to close within 14 days or 21 days at most. 30 day escrows are very uncommon in the investment uh, purchasing end of it. Not, I mean, there's still uh, 30 to 45 days when you're buying as a homeowner for a consumer um, uh, primary standard. purchase. Yeah. That that's still uh, fairly, um, uh, you know, fairly. Uh, yeah, I couldn't. Average. I couldn't understand why my offer didn't get uh, accepted when I, I said the the only contingencies I had were I had to sell these two other houses. <laughs> <laughs> right. All, all of those, uh, and, and so the people that that are able to get the best deals today in in. Um, 
in the investment uh, part of the real estate market. And that's all really I serve at Pacific Private Money. We serve, uh, we make loans to real estate investors for any number of reasons, but uh, mostly for those who are buying, fixing, and uh, uh, flipping property. And so that's, that's one reason is speed. The second reason would be the condition of the property. So we've actually made quite a few loans lately where um, it's a failed uh, a remodel from a previous oh, flipper yeah. who ran yeah. out of money and, yeah. and the property is just sitting there and maybe it's been all the torn uh, down to the studs yeah. inside. Yeah. It's not on, uh, yeah, or, or a house that's actually in great condition but the kitchen's missing. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> we just we just closed a loan like that uh, in December. You're, where the, you're not going anywhere residential with a residential mortgage on that because an appraiser is going to go out. He's going to see it's not there, and you you're back in a catch twenty two. Don't they just assume you go out to McDonald's and A and W every, <laughs> every time for dinner? So condition of the property is a big one, but I'll tell you that for for most of my clients, and I do serve a lot of borrower clients who have excellent credit and yeah. are uh, bank quality. But they just, they do not even try to use bank money because uh, they know that speed and reliability are two important factors in being able to play in this real estate market. And what I mean by reliability <coughs> is, is if someone comes to me with a loan application on a Monday or a Tuesday and says to me, I have to close this by next Friday. And that's happened. Right. It happens every day. <laughs> <laughs> That's the type of loan applications we get. Nine out of ten loan applications are, I have to close by next Friday. And so, you know, we can um, do an initial underwriting very, very quickly. Sometimes even over the phone, I can pull up information uh, through the various internet resources that I have uh, or one of my agents. Yeah, yeah, and, and virtually on the phone, I can say, it, uh, based on the information that they give me verbally and based yeah. on the information I look at, I can actually say, you know, if everything you tell me is true, right. I promise you I can close well, by next well, here, Friday. And here's a major thing is how much down payment. If they're putting down, you know, 50% down payment, right. you can almost always do the almost always do the loan. I, I can think of one other reason of people needing a loan quickly, or no, excuse me, of people wanting to go hard money, is sometimes what happens, and I, I've dealt this with this before, you get borrowers who get so frustrated with dealing with banks, with having to Give well, that's part answer. of the reliability that yeah. I'm talking about. Is can you rely on your bank yeah. to close within 21 days? Let's say you have a, a you know, you, you do get, you, you do a three-week right. escrow. Yeah. Some banks can, but can you rely on them? That's or, the problem or, or with a big hassle, bank. Or just the hassle. You know, I don't, I don't have to answer for every deposit over $200. Right. Where did that money come from? I mean, I, you know, you, you get a certain segment of, of the borrower population there. I think one thing that we have to say though is that when you're talking about the hard money and the good credit thing. Oftentimes, Mark, back me up if I'm right on this, but I think I am, is you're not looking at the borrower who would otherwise be buying a primary home, taking a 30-year fixed loan and holding the loan forever. They have a specific purpose in mind with that property. That money is a vehicle to help them accomplish that, and they appreciate that and then are willing to accept those terms on that basis. No, that's absolutely right, and, and you hit on, on a, a third reason why someone with a high FICO score would use a hard money loan, and that's because the banks aren't making short-term right. loans. They don't want to make a six-month or a 12-month loan. They're in the market to create these loan products that they're then going to sell in sell. the secondary yeah, market. So you can't sell, and there's no secondary market for a six or 12-month loan. So, uh, so you know, last but not least, you know, the first reason was speed, the second reason was reliability, but the third reason uh, might be uh, uh, as important as, as speed, and that is it's a short-term loan, and that particular loan product is not generally available through a bank unless you have a line of credit. And of course, we're, maybe we're going to talk about yeah. that in a little bit, lines of credit. Uh, uh, if all goes well, we'll start to come back in the market in a big way. We'll see, uh, and because uh, I know a lot of my clients who would love to have a, a line of credit on real estate that they use. Not that they wouldn't still come to me, because again, you know, lines of credit different uh, purpose, yeah. for different purposes. But uh, I mean, can you imagine being the bank and saying, knowing ahead of time that this property is only going to be around for about six months, mm -hmm. and trying to offer, you know, even a five percent interest rate right. and you know, a quarter point or something small. Yeah. I mean, it's just not worth it to the bank to go through all that hassle themselves. So it's just easier to say, you know what, no. Right, we don't make those products. Yeah, yeah and the difference between <clears throat> what you're offering and what are, what are your rates nowadays for 
hard money loans? Well, they're, they're, they're still relatively high given what bank rates are. I mean, we've consistently for the last couple of years been charging anywhere from 10 to 11 percent for a short-term six-month uh, flipper type loan, as right. we call it. So, and, and again, it's not so much the interest rate because again, you know, a good real estate investor is, uh, uh, is savvy in the use of leverage in, uh, in, in taking the capital that either they have or maybe they have an equity partner, which a lot of my clients do, and they take their, uh, their pool of capital and they leverage it with hard money. Uh, some of them will do it aggressively. Some of them will take advantage that will go up to 70%. Others will use it a little bit more conservatively and maybe only do you know 50% uh, leverage with a hard money loan. Uh, but what they have found is, is they're able to make more money paying 10% for my capital because they're able to do more properties. And right. so it's oh, just, particularly yeah. for the, you know, the return, your yield, your return on your dollar invested, the return on your equity, the borrower's equity actually increases through the use of leverage. And then again, that's that's a classic mm -hmm. uh, real estate principle is is when you're investing, the smart use of leverage will, will boost your yields. And even at 10%, you can still make more money in investment real estate uh, uh, borrowing hard money smartly than by going all cash. So now that's the borrower standpoint and uh, you have clients though who invest with you. Well we're yeah. called Pacific Private Money because the source of our capital is from private individuals and so we do uh, also market for um, lender or investor clients as we call them. We use uh, a, an investment product uh, that we call the Pacific Private Money Fund and that is a mortgage pool fund that uh, uh, is, is currently paying uh, over eight and a half percent on an annual basis to our investor clients and that money is used to fund uh, the loans we make at Pacific Private Money. So Here's our thoughts for the day. When tempted to fight fire with fire, remember that fi the fire department usually uses water. Uh, of course, and an axe. <laughs> but uh, not sure how that would affect it. Okay, and uh, to be sure of hitting the target, shoot first and we'll call whatever yeah. you hit the target. <laughs> right? That's what I always do. Makes me 100% uh, accurate then, right? There you go. Okay, tune in next week to The Best of Investing. We're going to be giving away nine more free vacations for answering trivia questions. Thanks for listening. On behalf of our team, I'm Edward Brown. Wishing you the best of investing. So long. <laughs>